If you think that making 10, yes, 10 attacks in a single round of combat, and I'm not talking with Eldritch Blast, and I'm not talking little powder puff attacks either, these things hit hard. Anyway, if you think that sounds awesome and powerful and fun, I think you're right, and I agree, and you're gonna wanna watch this video. So welcome to D4. Hey everybody, how's it going? And yes, welcome. Here at D4, every week we take a deep dive into character builds for our favorite RPGs. We crunch numbers about the builds, we theorycraft about them. Not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to build a character with the hopes of creating something that is both powerful but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for ideas or tips on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. It truly is. And I'm so glad you're here. So thanks for being here. My name is Colby. Really quick, if you would be interested in getting a written step-by-step -step cheat sheet to this build and every other build that I create for this channel, or if you're just looking for a way to lend some additional support to me and to the channel, I would really, really appreciate it if you'd consider joining as a member. There should be a little button down there that says join. For just a couple bucks a month, you get access to the library of write-ups that I create for every single one of these builds so that you don't have to go back and rewatch the video or take notes or anything. And yeah, it's just a really nice way to show me a little love and lend me a little support so that I can continue doing this and create more and better content. Humongous thank you to all of my channel members. You guys are so great. I could not do this without you. And for everybody else, I couldn't do it without you too. Thank you for being here. Just watching and liking and subscribing and commenting and even ringing the notifications bell are also fantastic ways to support the channel. So thank you. Right, I'm home. Uh, it was a fantastic vacation. It's great to be back. Even though I am totally jet lagged right now and caught a cold on the last day of my trip so my eyes are swollen and I'm feeling a little bit like a zombie but it does not matter the show must go on right so if there is one thing that I've learned in my almost three years of being a D&D YouTube content creator it's this when Kelly from the Dungeon Dudes says that's a four multi-class combo uh, we're breaking the mold here Colby build it Colby yeah. let's work together and do a video. You obey. <laughs> I mean, look at those eyes. How could anybody say no to that grisly, tall drink of water? So yes, the Dungeon Dudes, they put out their Monk Multiclass Tier Ranking video a while ago now by the time that you're watching this, and today is finally the day that I release my response. And yeah, I'm absolutely going to follow Kelly's request here that I just showed you guys, though I am making a few changes. After ping-ponging with him about it a little bit via Discord, and big thanks, Kelly, for letting me brainstorm with you and for providing some really fun ideas. Now, actually, a lot of even my longtime viewers might not realize this, but the very first monk build that I ever did was, in fact, a monk ranger. I called it the Munger, somewhat unfortunately, <laughs> and despite that ugly name, it was a fairly effective little build. Uh, check it out right there. But Wizards has released some new things since I did that video almost three years ago, and I've learned a few things myself to boot, so I think, yes, it's time to revisit the concept. But before we jump in, here is a dirty little secret about this build, and actually a lot of builds that I've done on this channel, and I guess you could say a dirty little secret about 5e in general. Because so many subclasses are so heavily front-loaded in their power, with this build and a lot of potential builds in 5e, sometimes it doesn't even matter what class you start off with and which one, assuming you're going with a martial character, that you take first to level 5. We're going to be doing a lot of multiclassing, and the real power of the build is going to come from getting a few levels in, yeah, four different classes. Now, some of you really hate this, and I get it. Multiclassing can maybe feel cheesy to you, or metagamey, or like you're somehow cheating on your character concept just so you can do more damage in combat or whatever. Personally, I love coming up with really fun and interesting character concepts and stories to justify multiclassing and or creating in my mind what feels like kind of a custom class, right? That just happens to take a bunch of levels in a bunch of different classes along the way. And we've talked about this before. It doesn't feel cheesy to me or problematic, 
but I also get that Wizards of the Coast's current desire, as evidenced by changes that they're making in 1D&D, Unearthed Arcana playtests, right, to make staying in just one class more appealing, mechanically. And frankly, I applaud them for taking steps in that direction. As much as I love multiclassing, when doing so just kind of unquestionably makes certain classes and builds stronger and better, then it kind of feels like you have fewer choices or options. Let straight classes scale better, especially non-spellcaster classes, right? So that it's a little bit tougher to decide if we want to multi-class or not. Please. As for this build, we're going to be a martial character, which means we really want to take our starting class to at least level 5 before looking elsewhere so we can get extra attack, right? We could start off as a ranger if we wanted to focus on getting more and better spell slots, as well as some nice exploration-based utility. We could go fighter if we wanted more ability score increases, at level 6 anyways. I'm gonna go monk for a couple of reasons. One. This build was inspired by the Dungeon Dude's monk multiclassing tier ranking video, and as such, it feels a little off to only take a monk dip later on in our career, right? But also, the concept for the character here is going to be one who makes a ton of attacks right on round one for some, for some massive, massive Nova damage. Yeah. And monks get super easy access to lots of attacks early on thanks to both extra attack and flurry of blows. And if we're going to be using flurry of blows, I figure it would be nice to get our unarmed strike up to d6 for slightly more damage, as well as some other nice features that monks get early on. So yes, the spreadsheet numbers actually do look ever so slightly better going this route, long term anyway. Okay, fine, and reason number three, I love monks, and I love building monk characters that are actually viable, nay, powerful in-game. And, okay, fine, reason number four, we're going to be using a monk subclass that I have never used before. So I'm so excited about that fact that I just wanted to get to it as soon as possible. And thus, I proudly present D&D build number 142, the Flurry of Darkness. Huge thanks to my good friend Randall Hampton for the artwork that he came up with for this concept. He does this every week and he's such a fantastic artist. If you want to follow him on social media to check out the other stuff that he's done and or potentially reach out to him to see if you could commission him to create some art for your character or your entire party, I will put links in the video description as always. But before we jump into the build, you guys, I am thrilled to have Magic Spoon as a sponsor for the video again this week because if nothing else, it means I get more free cereal. <laughs> and I have a new favorite, yes, maple waffle. Mmm, so good. Okay, so seriously, I am not a huge fanatic about what I eat, but I do try to stay in shape. I like to work out regularly, and yeah, a couple of times a week at least, I'll try to have a day where I'm cutting back on carbs and sugar. But that is so hard when you love cold cereal as much as I do. Anytime I play the, if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only eat one food for the rest of your life game, my choice, every time, cold cereal. And yeah, it's kinda hard to do low carb days when you're having a bowl of cereal before bed every night. So, about a year and a half ago, I discovered Magic Spoon and became a huge fan. First of all, their cereal has 13 to 14 grams of protein per serving, which is a ton for cereal. And it only has four to five net grams of carbs per serving as well, which is really low. More incredibly, it has zero sugar, zero. You would not believe that if you tasted it. Seriously, some of these flavors remind me of like my favorite cereal growing up watching Saturday morning cartoons, especially the cocoa flavor. Where did you come from? Um, because it like leaves your milk kind of chocolatey afterwards, which is the best. Also, I love mixing cocoa with peanut butter. This is creepy, because you get that classic, you know, chocolate peanut butter thing going. But they also have a ton of other great flavors like cinnamon roll, blueberry muffin, and birthday cake. <laughs> anyway, you guys should totally check them out. Just scan this QR code that's been up the whole time I've been doing this little plug, or go here to magicspoon.com slash d4, and I would appreciate it if you would do that so that they know I sent you. Also, if you decide to make a purchase at checkout, put in the promo code d4 and you'll save five bucks off your order. What's more, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. You've got nothing to lose. Try it for yourself and see how tasty it is. Big thanks to Magic Spoon, and let's jump into the build. All right. 
at level one for our starting class we are going to go fighter <laughs> Just keeping that meme alive, baby. You certainly wouldn't have to start fighter, but I want to, mostly because we need the weapon proficiency, but also for the fighting style, and constitution saving throw proficiency never hurt anyone either. So yes, when we first meet our champion, I think they're probably in the city watch, or maybe local militia, but I think they're there kind of reluctantly so. This character feels a bit lost at level one. like. They don't know what they're doing with their life, but they're unhappy with the life of a soldier or a guard. There is a darkness inside of them, and they might even be self-medicating in order to forget their unhappiness right now. I don't know what the source of that darkness is. You gotta figure that out for yourself. But yeah, it's an aspect of ourselves that we are going to have to learn to embrace. As for our race, we are gonna go bugbear. Some of you probably predicted this when you heard we were going for a Nova round right on round one, yeah? So yes, bugbears are kind of amazing for burst damage characters especially. Sure, they get some nice features like long-limbed to give them reach, and sneaky for stealth proficiency and moving through and stopping in a space big enough for only a small creature. But of course, the main reason that we wanted to go bugbear, mechanically anyway, was for the really incredible surprise attack feature, which tells us that if we hit a creature with an attack and that enemy hasn't had a turn in combat yet, we get to add 2d6 of damage to it. And no, there is no limit as to how many times we can apply this damage, so of course we will be doing everything in our power to take as much advantage of this ability as possible, because 2d6 per attack is quite a lot. As for our starting ability scores, I assume that we're going point by as always and say let's take a 15 dexterity plus one, a 15 wisdom plus one, and a 15 constitution plus one. Don't forget, these days the ability score bonuses we get from our racial can not only be applied to the abilities you want, but can either do a plus two in one ability and a plus one to another, or three plus ones, right? Monks are just inherently pretty mad, multiple ability score dependent, needing a, both a good wisdom and a good dexterity, and everybody wants a good constitution, so let's get a 16 in all three, which also happens to benefit our three most important saving throws and skill checks. Nice. And yeah, we'll just go ahead and dump the rest. I'm not going to lose a ton of sleep over having a poor strength, intelligence, or charisma here. As for our starting equipment, as a monk, we won't need much. Just your favorite, like, versatile D8 weapon. I'll say longsword, but you could do a battle axe or a warhammer. You're not going to be using it yet, though, so feel free to go, like, rapier or short sword for now, or even a ranged weapon. And sure, go ahead and grab some scale mail as well, if you want, and a shield, too, just to get us through, like, level one. As a fighter one, then, we get second wind, of course. This lets us, as a bonus action, once per short rest, heal ourselves for a d10 plus our fighter level. It's a nice little heal. And then we get a fighting style. And one of the really big reasons that I wanted to start fighter was to get a fighting style because I want to grab superior technique. See, making a lot of attacks is great especially if you can find ways to add good damage to every attack, right? But all of those attacks we're making aren't going to be doing much for us if we're not hitting. And the best way to ensure that we hit a lot is to get advantage. And maybe my favorite way to ensure that happens on this build anyway is to get our enemy prone, which we can do by taking trip attack for the Battlemaster maneuver that superior technique fighting style grants us. This gives us a single superiority die once per short rest to use on trip attack, right? Which is just a d6, that superiority die. But then if we hit with an attack, we can add this d6 to the damage and then force the enemy to make a strength saving throw, which if they fail, they're knocked prone. And as I'm sure you know by now, attacks made against prone enemies from five feet away are made with advantage. So yes, when I crunch numbers, I'm going to assume that the enemy is both large or smaller and that they've failed this save. I appreciate that that will not be the case every time, but yes, in the interest of exploring what's possible, I will assume best case scenario as always. That said, we won't have advantage on that first attack to knock them prone yet, but we will have a way to help make up for that fact very soon. At level two though, I think our brooding and unhappy hero has decided to give up the soldiering life. They have decided that they've become too attached to the material world, possessions, or maybe the esteem of society. They're tired of caring about what other people think. They need to disconnect, let go, pursue inner peace. 
but despite their best intentions, they might be bringing some darkness and some baggage with them in their journey here. Whatever your reasons, yes, we are taking monk levels now. So as a monk one, we get unarmored defense, which tells us that so long as we're not wearing armor or a shield, our armor class equals 10 plus both our dexterity and wisdom modifiers, giving us a 16 at the moment. And sure, while that is worse than scale mail plus a shield plus our dexterity modifier, we'd be dropping the shield anyway for other monk features we want to take advantage of. So this is actually the same that we would have with scale mail and a plus two from dex with no shield. So it's really not too bad. We also at monk one get martial arts, which tells us that we can use our dexterity instead of strength for unarmed strikes and monk weapon attacks, which are short swords and simple melee weapons without the two-handed or heavy property. Also, we can use a d4 for our unarmed strike damage as per our martial arts die, and that scales with monk levels, and that when we take the attack action, we can make an unarmed strike as a bonus action. All right, we are on our way to that 10 attack goal that I mentioned at the very beginning. At level three, we would be a monk two, and that means we get key, and yes, I still don't think we get enough key points as a monk, especially at early levels, and yeah, I'm upset that the current version of monks in the UA makes no attempt to fix the this at early levels anyway. Feel free to watch uh, Chris, Triant Monk, and I kind of debate the original version of the Unearthed Arcana Monk in Playtest 6 right over there. Hopefully by the time this video comes out, Wizards of the Coast will be well on their way to making some positive changes there. But anyway, we get one key point per monk level now, and those key points are used to fuel just about everything monks want to do that's cool. For now, we can use key for one of three things. Step of the Wind and Patient Defense let us spend a key point to take the dodge or disengage or dash actions as a bonus action instead. And Flurry of Blows lets us make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action instead of the usual one if we spend a key point to do so, so long as we take the attack action first. We also get unarmored movement here, which lets us gain extra move speed so long as we are unarmored and unshielded as we are. It's an extra 10 feet for now, but increases with monk level. And yes, I do think we're going to be making good use of all of our additional move speed on this character, especially after next level. Don't forget that we also get the dedicated weapon feature here at this level thanks to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which expands our potential list of what can be considered a monk weapon, right? After a short rest, we can now focus our key, touch one weapon, and so long as we're proficient in it, thanks fighter level, and it's not a heavy or special weapon, it's special to me, it can be our monk weapon. So yes, that long sword we've been lugging around with us, our favorite sword that we've brought with us from our soldiering days, or maybe it's like a fallen comrade's weapon that they bequeathed to us, dying on the battlefield, and we just haven't had the courage to use it yet. Maybe that's the source of our inner darkness. Anyway, we can use that weapon now, and even do so with two hands since it's versatile, letting our attacks with the weapon anyway do a d10 of damage, which is a nice little bump. At level four, we would be a monk three, and that means we get deflect missiles. This is a fun and super cinematic feature, like so many of these early level monk features. High on the coolness scale, not particularly high on the you're gonna get a lot of use out of this scale, but I still love it. It tells us that we can use our reaction if an enemy hits us with a ranged weapon attack to reduce the damage by a d10 plus our dexterity modifier plus our monk level, reducing most attacks at this level anyway to nothing. And if we reduce it to nothing, we can spend a key point to throw that weapon back using our martial arts die for the weapon's damage. Not something I'd recommend spending key on very often unless you think it might finish off an enemy. But then we also get our monk subclass here, our monastic tradition. And I'm curious to know what you think I'm going to take. Pause the video and type it in the comments. You may have originally anticipated Shadow Monk, I'm guessing. That was Kelly's idea in the video clip that I posted, right? And honestly, Shadow would be great here. Not only thematically, but mechanically too. I really like Shadow Monks a lot. But you know what? There's another subclass that I like even more here for this build. And like I said, it's one that I've had on my to-do list forever because I've never used it before. Did you guess Drunken Master? You did! High five. Whoops. So yes, that self-medicating I've been talking about, turns out our champion is a bit of an alcoholic, or maybe a borderline alcoholic if you don't want to go that far, or of course you can go another route if that's triggering for you for some reason. But I think our character has been trying to drown their sorrow somehow, or numb this darkness inside of them. At this point in their career, 
perhaps with the help of a trainer, or maybe just as part of like a fortunate lucky discovery, they got into a fight when they were a little intoxicated, they've learned to use their tipsy sway to their advantage in combat. Since I've never used this subclass before, let's actually read what Wizards of the Coast has to say about the Drunken Master. The way of the Drunken Master teaches its students to move with the jerky, unpredictable movements of a drunkard. A Drunken Master sways, tottering on unsteady feet, to present what seems like an incompetent combatant who proves frustrating to engage. The Drunken Master's erratic stumbles conceal a carefully executed dance of blocks, parries, advances, attacks, and retreats. A drunken master often enjoys playing the fool to bring gladness to the despondent or to demonstrate humility to the arrogant. But when battle is joined, the drunken master can be a maddening, masterful foe. Now, I appreciate that you are kind of simulating drunkenness here and not necessarily fighting drunk, and that this fighting style is probably much more technical and difficult to master than an inebriated person might be able to pull off, despite Jackie Chan movies and Tekken characters who might make you think otherwise. Still, I think it's a fun thing to work into the character's story if you want. Now, the main reason that I wanted to go Drunken Master here was for their level 3 feature, Drunken Technique. This simply tells us that when we use Flurry of Blows, we gain the benefit of the disengage action without having to spend any more key points. This means that we can safely walk away from our enemies without provoking an opportunity attack, and we also get an extra 10 feet of move speed when we do this, giving us a whopping 50 feet of move speed now. Why do I think this is so important? Frankly, it's because with our d8 hit die, and okay but not great armor class, which isn't going to even get good for a long time, monks in general, and especially this particular character, is not super tanky. I see them as more of a skirmisher, a hit and runner, and as such, I love the idea of being able to move in, make our attacks, and safely skirt away to keep ourselves out of harm's way as much as possible. This is going to be extra important later on in this build, as we'll see, but for now, I appreciate the hit and run combat style this opens up for us. Now, sure, we could have gotten similar benefits by grabbing the mobile feat, but Again, with all of our multi-classing, our ability score increases or feats are going to be severely delayed for the most part, and we need all of them for ability score increases so we can eventually, at least, get both a great dex and a great wisdom. If you start with a free feat at your table, feel free to grab mobile and then, sure, go a different subclass if you want, or of course, just take a different subclass if you want anyway. But I love the Drunken Master best for this build. Speaking of ability score increases and feats, yes, at level 5 we'd be a monk 4, and we get our first, and actually last for quite some time, ability score increase or feat. And yes, I want to use it to bump our dexterity, so we can at least have a plus 4 mod there to benefit our attacks, our armor class, and even the DC of our trip attack as well, which is super important. We also get one of my favorite cool if not super useful all the time features here, slow fall, which lets us use Use our reaction when we fall to reduce the damage taken by five times our monk level, which is quite a bit and lets us fall from 50 to 60 feet on average at this level anyway without taking any damage. Nice. Finally, something that I often forget to mention, with Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, monks also got quickened healing at this level in case you wanted to spend two key points on it actually and an action to heal hit points equal to one roll of our martial arts die plus our prefer efficiency bonus. So yeah, that's four or five hit points on average here for the cost of half our key and an action. Right. I guess there's a good reason why I often forget to mention this ability. <laughs> but at level six, things get really pretty good for us. As a monk five, we get extra attack, so we can attack twice now when we take the attack action. Very important, meaning we can potentially attack four times on our turn when we use Flurry of Blows, right? We also get that ever controversial feature, Stunning Strike, which lets us spend a key point when we hit with a melee weapon attack to try and stun our target. They make a constitution saving throw against our wisdom-based D see, and if they fail, they are stunned until the end of their next turn. Amazing when it works, but it tends to fail more often than not, especially when we need it, it seems like, in my experience anyway, and I know that's the experience for a lot of you as well, especially here with our moderate wisdom and the average enemy in 5e having a decent to high constitution saving throw. Still, 
This is a really fun toy to play with sometimes. It's fantastic when it works, but yeah, I'm not gonna assume that we're using it during our Nova round necessarily. Another feature monks got from Tasha's that I also often fail to mention, that is quite a bit better in my opinion than quickened healing, is focused aim. This tells us that if we miss with an attack roll, we can spend one to three key points to increase that attack roll by two for each key point we spend. Now, yeah, that's super expensive. We only have five key points, but for those of us who are putting a lot of eggs in a big Nova round of damage basket, and who will probably get advantage on their other three attacks this turn if we can just get this first one to hit, right, and trip them, and when every attack we land on this first round does an extra 2d6 of damage because we're a bugbear, I can definitely see spending key points here to get our first attack to land if we think we only missed by like from two to six, right? So yes, when I crunch numbers, I'm going to assume that we've got an extra plus six to hit on that first attack, even though it might mean spending up to three of our precious five key points to do so. Again, assuming best case scenario as always. Finally, at this level, don't forget that our martial arts die goes from a D4 to a D6 here for a little more damage on those unarmed strikes. Okay. Speaking of crunching numbers, yes, at level six, it's time for our first damage report. So what does combat look like for us here during our Nova round? Pretty simple. On round one, you run up to an enemy who hasn't gone in combat yet and attack them four times. Twice with your longsword, twice with your body, using flurry of blows. On the first attack that lands, hopefully the first, especially with help from focused aim, you apply your d6 superiority die in damage and try to trip them. Assuming you hit and they fail their saving throw, you make the rest of your attacks against them with advantage. And yeah, even though you're long-limbed, you're going to want to move up to be within 5 feet, right? Otherwise you don't get that advantage. Each hit adds 2d6 of damage thanks to our bugbear's surprise attack, as well as 4 from our dexterity modifier, of course, for a potential total of 2d10 plus 10d6 plus 16. And so, against an enemy with a 10 a AC here, we would do 68 damage during our Nova round on average, and against an enemy with a 15 AC, it would be 63. And while that's not insane burst damage, it's still really strong, especially for level 6, landing us kind of in like the bottom of tier 1 or maybe top of tier 2 compared to other burst damage builds that I've done to date. Check the video description to see those spreadsheets and graphs and comparisons. Okay. Nice work, Drunken Master. And we've got a lot of fun monk toys and speed to play with here, and some decent sustainable damage to boot, even if we're out of key. Though, of course, our survivability goes down significantly if we're not using Flurry of Blows because no free disengage, right? So hopefully you're not having to use a lot of key on that first attack with focused aim, so you can continue to Flurry of Blows and stick to that hit and run tactic on subsequent rounds, right? Okay, we're off to a good start. Let's see where we can go from here. At level 7, I think it's time to leave Monk behind. If you feel like you want to get to Monk 6 so that your unarmed strikes can be magical, and for the fun and sometimes useful tipsy sway feature that drunken masters get, go ahead. I'll assume that we're able to get like an insignia of claws magic item or maybe an eldritch claw tattoo or something, so I'm not super worried about the magical attacks on our unarmed strikes thing, but you will know better than I do if you're going to need this feature at level 7. If not, then I think at this point in our character's career, we We've decided to just go ahead and finally embrace this darkness that we've been carrying around inside of us. As we've learned to shed aspects of the material world, we've gotten closer to nature, but maybe not so much the squirrels and the birdies. More like the worms and the centipedes, mushrooms and lichen, things that grow in the dark. Maybe we've been spending our free time communing with nature in these places, caves and old growth forests learning to commune with nature here and maybe even draw power from her as we embrace our darker side. Whatever your reasons, yes, we are taking ranger levels now. And thus, as a ranger one, we get, thanks to Tasha's again, uh, the deft explorer feature, which gives us canny here, which is basically expertise light, letting us double our proficiency bonus in one skill that we're proficient in. I think if it were me, I would take stealth here. Going first in combat is super important for us and there's no easier way to ensure that we attack before our foes than by getting surprise on them, right? So let's do our best to ensure that happens as often as possible going forward, shall we? We also get favored foe now, which would be decent if it didn't require concentration, as is with our concentration and proficiency bonus times per day, 
We can mark a target, and thereafter, once per turn, when we hit that target with an attack, we can add a d4 of damage, which will be nice when we're out of spell slots, I suppose. At level 8, we would be a ranger 2, and that means we get a fighting style, and I'm kind of of two minds here on what we should take. On the one hand, if we absolutely wanted to eke out as much damage as possible, we'd go dueling here. And paradoxically, perhaps, start using our longsword with just one hand again, since doing so would add two damage to each attack we make with it if we have the dueling fighting style. So yeah, even though that lowers the damage die from a d10 to a d8, adding plus two to damage would still raise our average damage by one. So sure, I guess in the interest of exploring what's possible damage-wise, I'll assume that we went that route. But honestly, if it were me playing this character in-game, I think I might go blind fighting instead. Blind fighting gives you blind sense in a 10 foot radius, letting you even detect invisible creatures, and it just seems so on point for this character concept, to say nothing of the usefulness of having blind sense. Maybe even letting us do some shenanigans like cast fog cloud that we could still see in and things like that. Or yeah, if we went shadow monk, letting us see at least in a 10 foot radius inside the darkness spell that shadow monks could potentially cast, things like that. Of course, those tactics prevent problems for your allies potentially so I'm not going to assume that we're going that route, but blind fighting can still be super useful and again, really on point for us thematically. As for the spells that we get at Ranger 2, we could take Fog Cloud like I mentioned, but the one I really want to make sure that we grab is, yeah, Hunter's Mark. This spell enjoys a mixed reputation among D&D players. A lot of people think that it's not very good, since even though it lets you add a d6 of damage to all of your weapon attacks at the cost of your concentration, it takes a bonus action both to cast and to transfer to another enemy once the target you've got it on is dead. I'm gonna continue to argue here that there is a time and a place for it and other spells like it, particularly if you're trying to burst down an enemy early on in combat and you're making a ton of attacks in a round right? Of course, the question is, for bugbears like us, shouldn't we be making flurry of blows attacks with our bonus action on round one? The answer is yes. If combat starts and you don't have Hunter's Mark up, then don't bother. At least not until round two, and even then, maybe not, depending on the enemy in the fight. But if you're sneaking and you're able to get the drop on your enemy especially, then sure, go ahead and drop Hunter's Mark on them if you can before jumping them. Or, yeah, again, I say this a lot, if you can tell that a fight is about to break out, fire this off before you roll initiative, if possible. Again, if you can't, don't worry about it. At my table, and I know at a lot of yours, pulling something like this off isn't too difficult. At some tables, the DM might say, if you say I cast Hunter's Mark, then we're rolling initiative, and you can do that on your turn, right? So know your table. I'll assume that we've got it active on subsequent damage reports. If you don't, then we'll want to lower our numbers slightly, but for as many attacks as we're going to be making here, I think it's really worth it if we can get this off. At level 9, we would be a Ranger 3, and that means we get our Ranger archetype, our Ranger subclass. And as most of you have guessed by now, and especially based on that excerpt from Kelly's request that I threw in at the beginning, if nothing else, yes, we are going Gloomstalker. This is probably the most powerful Ranger subclass in 5e at this point, though I've actually only used it a couple of times on builds, I believe. Once in the uh, Gloomstalker build, and then earlier in the uh, the Needler. That's one of my favorites, that dart-focused character. But yes, Gloomstalkers are undoubtedly strong. At level 3, they get some really great features. First up, they get Gloomstalker Magic, which just gives us the Disguise Self spell for free. Nice bit of utility there. But then we get Umbral Sight, which increases our dark vision range by 30 feet, and also tells us that when we're in darkness, not dim light, but straight up darkness, though it need not be magical darkness, if a creature we're fighting is relying on dark vision to see us, which the vast majority of creatures who could see us in darkness would be relying on, then we are invisible to that creature, and that by itself is potentially pretty fantastic, meaning we would have advantage on our attacks against them and they would have disadvantage on attacks against us, right? So yeah, it kind of goes without saying, try to stick to the shadows when you can. Anyway, that's not even the best feature that we get here. The strongest feature for us here, of course, is Dread Ambusher, which tells us that 
first up, we get a bonus to our initiative rolls equal to our wisdom modifier, and that by itself is amazing since we've got a plus four dexterity and a plus three wisdom. That means at level nine here, our initiative rolls would be made with a plus 11. And for someone who benefits as much as we do by going before our enemies, that's huge. But then on our first turn in combat, our move speed increases by 10 feet, meaning that we are at 60 feet of move speed now if we flurry of blows on our first turn. Amazing. And if we take the attack action on that turn, we can make an extra attack. Also, if that extra attack hits, we do an extra d8 of damage. All fantastic Nova damage increases for us. And just in time for our level 9 damage report. Since last check, we've added 1 damage to our weapon attacks via the dueling fighting style. Technically 2, but by reducing our weapon die by one, right? It's an average of one extra damage. We've added a d6 to all of our attacks, potentially via Hunter's Mark, and added an extra weapon attack during our Nova round as well, plus a d8 of damage on that attack. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, on average, we would do 113 damage during our Nova round. And against an enemy with a 16 AC, it would be 103. And it feels really great to break that century mark by level 9, right? Even on a middling enemy AC, right? on. Now granted, I'm making some assumptions here, but I very often do. That's nothing strange for my builds. Compared to other Nova or burst damage builds that I've done to date, I'd say we're more kind of squarely in the upper half of tier 2 at this level. We've made some nice gains, sure, but some of those other builds just made nicer ones in the last three levels. But there is a ton in store for us here very soon, so don't you fret. Because at level 10, yes, our champion is going to go back now to the their martial training that they eschewed at the beginning of their career. Now that they've embraced their inner darkness and found peace, they've realized that there are things from their past that they might need to revisit and improve upon. Arguably, we would have been better off, at least mechanically, by going fighter before Gloomstalker here. But that depends on some things, and the difference would have been fairly minimal, and I did want to make this feel more like a monk ranger than a monk fighter, you know? But yes, going fighter too here means we get action surge that darling of nova damage dealers the world over letting us take two actions once per short rest instead of one and yes in case you didn't know since gloomstalkers extra attack triggers when we take the attack action then yes it would trigger twice if we action surge on the first round of combat meaning we now get eight yes eight attacks during our nova round right but wait there's more because at level 11, we would be a fighter 3. And that means we get our martial archetype, our fighter subclass. And finally, I'm going to do the thing that so many of you are always begging me to do when I take fighter levels and go, you guessed it, Echo Knight. Now, Echo Knight is super strong. Some might argue too strong. It was given us by Matt Mercer of Critical Role fame, and a lot of you are going to say it's broken. And if you're one of those people, that's totally cool. I'd probably just skip Fighter 3 altogether if you don't want to, or can't use this subclass, and just head straight for our next class dip. Or you could take Battlemaster, that's going to give us more superiority die, a little more damage on our Nova Round 2, wouldn't be bad. Or I mean, you could even go back to Monk here, sure, no worries, get more key points. But for those of you who, like me, apparently left your integrity back at level 1, yeah, Echo Knight. Hey, come on now, it's official content, right? I don't think it's as overpowered as Twilight Clerics. I say we use it. I think I've only done so on one other of my 141 builds, right? Uh, the Vengeance Pally. Anyway. Echo Knights get the really cool and fun Manifest Echo ability. This says that we can manifest an echo of ourselves with a bonus action that lasts until it's destroyed or dismissed or we manifest another one or are incapacitated. Now, this echo has one hit point, an AC of 14 plus our proficiency bonus, so it's pretty squishy, though it is immune to all conditions and it uses our saving throws. We can mentally command this echo to move up to 30 feet on our turn, no action required, but if it it gets more than 30 feet away from us, it's also destroyed. But then on our turn, as a bonus action, we can swap places with our Echo, super cool, make an attack from our Echo's location instead of ours when we make an attack, 
super cool. And we can make this choice for each attack, by the way, which really might be handy on round one with all the burst damage that we are going to be doing. We might need our echo to be attacking for us if we've taken out our first target, maybe. But then also, if an enemy moves away from our echo, we can use our reaction to make an opportunity attack from their position instead of our own. Now, for the uninitiated, you might think that these are a nice little host of features and we should be pretty satisfied with our level 3 Echo Knight dip, but we haven't even got to the good stuff yet. Because we also get Unleash Incarnation here, and this tells us that Constitution modifier times per day, so that's three for us, right? If we take the attack action, we can make an additional attack from our Echo's position. And yeah, if we action surge, that means two more attacks this round, right? Though. To be fair, we could only Nova this hard once per day, right? Because we can only do this three times per day, and we'd be using two of them during our Nova round. Still, if we wanted to, now, yes, we could make 10 attacks on round one of combat. Two for our attack action, plus one for Gloomstalker, Dread Ambusher, plus one for Unleash Incarnation, Action Surge, do it all again for four more, and then bonus action, Unarmed Strike, for two more, right? And yeah, each of these would do an extra 2d6 from Bugbear's Surprise Attack, and 1d6 from Hunter's Mark if we got it off. Yowzers. So at level 12, where do we go from here? We take Druid levels, of course. <laughs> I actually really do like a Druid dip here. The route we're going doesn't feel like too much of a stretch to me conceptually and character story-wise. And frankly, going fighter or druid or both from ranger never really feels like much of a stretch for me. Rangers are kind of already a cross between a fighter and a druid, right? At this point, with our martial prowess nearly perfected, we've decided to delve further into the nature and darkness aspect of our character, gleaning more from the magic inherent in the dark things of the world. So yes, as a Druid 1, we learn Druidic, the special language Druids get to communicate with one another by leaving signs in nature, right? And then we get Druid spells. I'm just going to recommend the usuals here, nothing that we would be using to increase our damage on our Nova round necessarily, but Guidance is always handy to increase skill checks, especially those stealth checks, right? Healing Word, of course, to heal from range and with a bonus action. Goodberry is super efficient for healing and provides some nice utility as well. And then Entangle is a great spell, it's a bit of a poor man's web, similarly restraining enemies. At level 13, we would be a Druid 2, and that means, first up, we get Wild Shape. Now, typically druids use wild shape to turn into beasts of one quarter challenge rating or less, and there are tons of rules around using wild shape, like you can't cast spells when you're wild shaped, etc. I'm not going to get into it too much because we are going to be using our wild shape uses for other things. Just remember, it takes an action to use and you get two uses of it per short rest. As for the first thing that I want to sometimes, at least potentially, use our wild shape for, it would be wild companion. Since Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Druids can, with a use of their Wild Shape, cast the Find Familiar spell, letting us summon a happy little pet that can provide some nice utility for us, but also, potentially, take the Help action on their turn to provide us advantage on our first attack. And this is fantastic, since it would let us now get advantage on that first attack that we're making each round, meaning that that first attack that we're trying to trip our target with during our Nova round, right, that we didn't have advantage on before, well, now we have advantage on that too. And we can still potentially have up to a plus six to hit on it if we want as well, I guess. Now, unfortunately, this version of the Find Familiar spell only lasts a number of hours equal to half our druid level, which makes me super sad, and you might not want to blow a use of Wild Shape for this as a result. I would only do so if you think it fairly likely that you'll either have multiple combat encounters within that hour, right? Or you tend to get short rests after every combat or two at your table. And since you are a monk with fighter levels who wants to get that superiority die back as often as possible, I really hope that that is happening for you. Assuming that this is the case, having advantage on all of our attacks during our Nova round will be super awesome. Druid 2, though, is the level that just keeps on giving because we also get our Druidic Circle here, our Druid subclass, and yes, in case you haven't guessed it, we're going Spores Druid here. Hence all the fascination with the things of the dark, right? We love death. And mushrooms. 
mushrooms are awesome. There are some real pros and cons with this subclass, so let's get into why we're going this route. First up, as a Spores Druid, we get additional spells. It's just chill touch here at this level. Not a bad little cantrip, doing some damage and imposing disadvantage on the enemy's attack rolls until your next turn. But then we also get Halo of Spores, and this is mediocre at best, honestly. It says that when an enemy moves within or starts their turn within 10 feet of us, we can use our reaction to do 1d4 damage to them unless they succeed on a constitution save, and there's no half damage on a successful save or anything. Yeesh. Honestly, I might not ever use this. I know we don't have a super consistent and regular use of our reaction, but we would do a lot more damage with an opportunity attack than we would with this, and especially thanks to that echo, our ability to make opportunity attacks is gonna be a little more consistent than most characters. So yeah, I'm not even gonna put it in the damage calculations. More importantly, we get Symbiotic Entity here, which is the mechanical reason that we wanted to take Druid levels in the first place, right? This is potentially a really amazing ability. It tells us that as an action, we can expend a use of our wild shape to gain four temporary hit points per druid level, so eight, and then while those hit points are still on us, we do an extra d6 of necrotic damage on every single melee weapon attack. Now, there are some big huge caveats to this ability, right? First up, it's an action to use not super compatible with our we have to be attacking on round one to get the most out of our Nova potential selves. That said, it does last for 10 minutes. Now that's not a ton, but it does make it a lot more likely that when combat starts, you're gonna have this active, or that you can get it going when you feel like danger is imminent, especially if you're stealthing and trying to get the drop on your enemy, right? But regardless, you could theoretically use this as your action, cast Hunter's Mark as a bonus action, wait six seconds, and then attack. But yeah, it's not foolproof, it's not guaranteed, but yes, I will assume that we've got it going when combat breaks out. Lower your expectations on the numbers if you don't have it, right? Also, yes, the extra damage only lasts so long as you've got those temporary hit points. And at level 13, eight temporary hit points are not gonna last all that long. For this reason, I think you can really only make good use of this Spores Druid ability by either investing a lot of levels into Druid so that you can get a lot more temporary hit points, which we have not done, or make a burst damage character, whose number one goal is to just front load a ton of damage, taking out a target or two early on in the fight, after which they don't care quite so much if their damage decreases because they've done their job. Obviously, we fall into that latter category, but this is actually also one of the main reasons I decided to go Drunken Master with this build rather than Shadow or something else. If you can strike hard and then flit away out of danger, with our insane move speed and free disengage that would allow us to get behind our barbarian or paladin friend, then I feel a lot more confident about holding on to our temporary hit points and thus damage for a few more rounds, right? So yes, bob and weave, hit and run, name of the game. Don't forget that thanks to multiclassing, we now do have second level spell slots, even though we don't have any second level spells. Okay. At level 13, it is time for our next damage report. And since last check, we've made some incredible increases. Action surge another attack with each action thanks to our echo, and yes, an extra d6 of damage on every hit during our Nova round as well. Assuming, of course, that everything goes according to plan for us. Don't forget that we potentially have advantage on that first attack now as well as subsequent ones that we were getting from trip attack, right? Thanks to our familiar. And so, Against an enemy with a 10 AC, we would on average here do 265 damage during our Nova round, and against an enemy with a 17 AC, it would be 239. Gee, who's a fat trigger? Put that pea shooter down. That's like 150% increase since last check. Yikes. Yes, we are definitely feeling ourselves and all of our dark, flurious power right now. So strong. And this like launches us right up into middle of tier one territory compared to other Nova builds that I've done to date at this level. Nice. All right, so we've kind of gotten all of the main things that I wanted to get to at this point. Where do we go from here? Level 14. 
Paladin would be great, sure, but ugh, too much multiclassing. We don't have even close to the charisma or the strength to pull that off, so no. Some of you are probably thinking that we should go Assassin Rogue, and while that's definitely an option, and not a bad one at that, I kind of went that route with my Gloomstalker build before, and we've already managed to secure ourselves advantage with some decent consistency, which is kind of the big draw of going assassin with Gloomstalker, right? I mean, sure, the automatic crits on surprise are also really nice. And so if you want to go for it, go for it. But I think personally, I would rather just go back to ranger here. So we'd be a ranger four so we can grab that ability score increase or feat that we've been missing for so long, letting us finally cap our dexterity at 20 to help our damage, our AC, and even our trip attack DC. Not to mention better stealth checks, better dexterity saving throws, better initiative rolls. We get a ton out of a capped dexterity here. And then at level 15, yeah, for a similar reason, I think I'd go Fighter 4 here to grab that ability score increase so we could then bump our wisdom, taking it to an 18. Remember, on this character, that's going to increase our armor class, plus our monk DC, plus our druid and ranger spells, not to mention our wisdom saves and even our initiative rolls. Wisdom is almost as important for us as dexterity is. But at level 16, I think at this point, our best bet is either going to be go back to monk for more key points and other mostly utility benefits, or back to Druid for more and better spells, more temporary hit points from Spore's Druid, longer duration on our wild shape and familiar, and so yeah, I think I'd probably go Druid here. That means second level spells, and while there are a ton of amazing options, Hold Person, Heat Metal, Lesser Restoration, Pass Without Trace, especially great on those of us trying to stalk and surprise our enemies, right? Spike Growth and more. There's nothing here that I will assume that we're going to be using to increase our damage, especially during our Nova round, so go ahead and PYF, pick your favorite. And then finally, for us, at level 17, we would be a Druid 4. That means another ability score increase or feat. And yeah, I'm going to cap our wisdom score now here as well at 20, which just feels really awesome. So for our final damage report then at level 17, since last check, we haven't seen a ton of increases to our Nova damage. To our survivability, yes. To our utility, absolutely. But the only real bump to our damage came in the form of a plus one to our dexterity, still. The character feels a lot more well-rounded here than it did at level 13, and I really like that. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class here, we would on average during our Nova round do 275 damage. And against an enemy with an 18 AC, it would be 253. And compared to other Nova builds that I've done to date at this level, that's kind of back to like the bottom of tier 1. Nothing to be ashamed of by any means, but definitely we plateaued a little bit since last check, right? All right. So let's get into some final thoughts here. The tier score for this character, if you take all of the damage that they do during their Nova round at each of the enemy ACs that we calculated for at each of the four damage reports and just average it into one big number, we end up with a 152, landing us comfortably in like the bottom half of tier one, which is a really fantastic place to be. Also, surprisingly for me, guess which build it beat out here. Yep that other Gloomstalker build that I made that went with the kind of typical Gloomstalker Ranger fighter assassin rogue, which is, yeah, it's just under this build on that spreadsheet at 142. Seriously. Now, the difference here is arguably for a number of reasons, but I would not have suspected that pairing a monk with a Gloomstalker would end up outpacing an assassin damage-wise on average over the lifetime of their career. Admittedly, to be fair, if we did get some surprise with that build, the damage would be way higher, but I did not make that assumption since getting surprise on your enemy in 5e depends on so many things, as I discussed in my uh, Assassin's Creed build a few months ago, right? Nevertheless, I am super impressed with where we ended up here. Now, the question I always want to answer when I do these Dungeon Dudes inspired builds is, is this better than a straight class ranger or monk? Of course, we didn't really follow the Dungeon Dudes rules here on their multiclassing tier ranking videos, right? They want to consider multiclassing with just two classes, and we did four. I think, though, what we ended up with is unquestionably stronger than either build had it gone just straight class. But would it have been if we had just stuck with Monk and Ranger only? Yeah, I think so. 
monks, they just don't scale all that well, as I've discussed so often, damage-wise at least, unfortunately. So finding a way to add both more attacks via Gloomstalker and a nice spell like Hunter's Mark to add more damage on all of those attacks that we're making is really great. And sure, a straight ranger would have gotten more and better spells, but Gloomstalkers wouldn't have seen too much of an increase to their damage anyways, especially their burst damage, without those levels in Monk. I truly think that this is a combo that's greater than the sum of its parts. Even if we didn't do fighter and druid stuff on top of it, but then yeah, adding those things just really kind of takes it to the moon. I would love to know if you agree or disagree with me, but regardless, that's the build for the week and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope you know that I love you. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for the channel. I hope you have a really great day and a fantastic week. And if you don't, I hope that you'll hang in there. Don't give up. You can do this. I hope that you be good and kind and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Bye-bye. Hey, it's good to be back home again. Yes, it is. Sometimes this old farm feels like a long lost friend. Yes, and hey, it's good to be back home again. It is so good to be back, as awesome as that trip was, and it really was amazing. In case you hadn't guessed, Here's a little hint as to where I've been, <laughs> and wow, what a trip it was. But there's no place like home <laughs> when it comes to just the comforts and the peace and tranquility. Mm, it's been lovely being back. Yes, for those who are probably asking, I got a haircut. It was just, it was too much. It was too much. And I was just like, I'm in Paris, the style capital of the world. I should probably just go to a barber and be like, je ne parle pas français, but you just do whatever you think looks good. And this is what they came up with. I kind of liked it. Come on. There's no way this can be out of battery. Teleprompter remote out of batteries. Hold, please. Whew. Half hour later, got it working. Action surge, do it all again. <laughs> Don't. Don't say that. With our insane move speed and free disengage to get behind our barbal... <laughs> Barbaladin. <sighs> okay. Did it. Ooh, I feel like butter scraped over too much bread. <laughs>